So you've just seen this demonstration of the, of the digital tech platform. I will now attempt a demonstration of the Google Forms, uh, and then I'll return to the PowerPoint. We'll see whether this actually works very well. Um, so first, I'll just launch. Uh, this is the you know I just go to Google as the home page in my browser. So what I will do now is just type Google Forms. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. I want my Google Drop. Google Drop. So this is uh, free. Anyone can sign up. And we'll see when it works. Okay, go to, so, so this is the, their advertisement for themselves. All your files right where you are. Go to Google Drive. Instead of that, let me show you the movie that I recorded because, you know, I'm working for you. Interesting. Okay, let me try. Maybe I can just force it to really grow on No, I'll tell you what. Let me try it. I'm going to launch Chrome. Maybe they're like their own browser. So,
question is name. Type this text. And you don't need anything else, so just add item. So here's the second question. Question title. But, uh, oh no. Help text is where you type the, the actual question which is being asked of the student. I found this a little confusing the first time, but help text is just what, where you put this.
So, I think now this part should take up a lot of time. And I'm not sure how this will work. This, this, this will be somewhat difficult, uh, but, but I think we'll make it work. So here's, here's how I plan to do this. Now, again, there's some strange problem with this case. It's interesting, it looks fine on my screen, it's, it's strange here. So, let me read this to you. There'll be, oh no, I see, there's a problem. Um, well, then, in any case, the technology, this first page is, is just uh, a reminder of what the technology needs to look like. And you can use this as a guide to using either digital tech or Google Forms or some other thing you can use. Uh, Moodle is another open source platform that some of you may be familiar with. Yeah, I see so, so that's another possibility. Um, there's also, you know, this Blackboard.com is a huge corporation. They have this product for sale. There is a free version of it that you can also experiment with. I've never tried it myself. I don't know what it's like. But the main things that I have here, which for some reason you can't read, it says two things. For the technology, you need only two steps. The first step is the student step. They need to be able to see the questions and to type an answer and click submit. And then the second step is the faculty step. They need to be able, you need to be able to see the answers that the students submitted and take care of things like storing them, erasing them, uh, assigning grades. Uh, Etc. So, so all of the um, bookkeeping of the uh, professor for, for any class. So those those are the choices. Those, those are the only steps needed to um, to have the technology work. So the demonstration we've already seen uh, for for tech uh, it's, it's available or will soon be available, I guess. The integration with other tech systems is important. If some of you are already familiar with it, or the students are familiar with it, then that is also an advantage. And you're having access to the developer that, that if you want and, and his team. You can improve the system and there is no substitute for a system where you know the developers and they can do what you want. So I will urge you as faculty members to use some muscle make your provost create a committee for you to set the priorities for future development of digital tech. Uh, we did that at my university and it made a big difference. Google Forms event is very easy to use, just a few minutes to create an assignment. You can include images and other things in there. The output is a simple spreadsheet and uh, if you go Again, to this website, you can see that movie again. I believe I've posted that there as well. Um, more sophisticated tools that you should be asking for from digital tech are connections to Gradebook, maybe some calendar system so a student can see your, what have I got to do today? Ah, I see there's a warm up question from my chemistry professor. So I'll do that. I can click on it right there in the calendar and do that now. That would be a great feature. Uh, I think James Fraser showed you that in his system, when you go to grade a student, the student's picture is right there. So you can start to learn their names. I, I am terrible at learning names. Um, I have a huge problem, and having 150 students makes it completely impossible for me. To have those pictures, to me, would be worth, worth its, its uh, weighted goal. Great. Um, the ability to sort by the question, sort by the students, sort by time, other ways of, of viewing the answers also is, is a more sophisticated method that you can ask for them to build in. So, I'd like to go on to the writing exercise. And I have again uh, fresh copies of 
of these warm-up development pages, uh, which I will ask you to take one and pass around. This is the same one as yesterday, only it is on tax stationery. Um, but, but the process is the same, and I hope you saved the ones that you had yesterday to be able to work with these as, as the beginning of your actually developing for your class is very useful. Um, and if you, you can, again, on the, on the website, you can print out more copies of this and use it as necessary until you feel like, okay, you no longer need this form, and then you can just work directly on the computer or on whatever your writing system of choice might be. Yes. But keep a record of your early development of these problems so you can see how your style is developing, how your process of writing is, is improving, and then you can compare with each other. Uh, just like your students, once I meet here, uh, you're always welcome to, to email me or, or ask questions, but you are your own best allies. Uh, you can help each other, and you're, you're clever people, you're professors, you're very experienced with teaching. So I think once now that you have the sense of the beginning of just-in-time teaching, you can develop it on your own, make your own adjustments, take it in the direction that's most appropriate for you and for your students here at Tech. So here's what I would like to try to do for the next, or well, perhaps an hour. Um, I would like you to start again by working either alone or in pairs, whichever you prefer. And what I would like, if, if it's possible, is for you to think of what course in your department gives the students the most trouble? If you prefer, you can still focus on the course that you personally will be teaching next semester. Either one. Uh, whatever you think is best. But choose a course and working as a pair or alone. Once again, write, write some warm-up questions. If you have extra room on that paper, if you can come up with more than three questions, come up with five, six, ten, however many you think you can come up with in the next half an hour. And then, after you come up with um, some more warm-up assignments, take another 15 or 20 minutes and write some concept tests for peer instruction that would be linked. It would be the same day of class. Now, while you're doing that, you're, you're on your own for oh, 45 minutes at least, maybe an hour, however long it takes you to do this. In the meantime, I will be here. If anyone wants to come in and ask me questions, please do so. Um, I, I will work with the interpreters, and uh, I'll answer any question as it comes up. And then once we're done with this, we'll have some discussion. And then towards the end of the morning, we'll again have time exclusively for questions about how to make this work in your practice. Okay, ready? Go. Right. <laughs>
So what I'd like to do now is have a little bit of discussion about these things. Uh, and then towards for the for the last part of the workshop, I want to really make sure that I answer everybody's questions that they may have about the difficulties that may arise in, in using just in time teachers and, and also peer instruction. So first a little bit of uh, more structured conversation again within your subject areas. So again, if the mathematicians could trade questions with the other mathematicians, uh, and the physicists with the physicists, etc. Um, and I'd like to, to you to look at the questions that, that your colleagues have written and discuss with them uh, these three questions, which I think are, are important. First of all is, do the questions focus on the central ideas to be learned that day? So this, this is you know, always an important thing with the warm-up questions is to make sure that they really are on the essential item as opposed to on some some area that's that's related but maybe isn't really the central theme of that day's lesson. Um, another one is to be sure the questions are sufficiently open for students to expose their thinking. And the is the difficulty level right? So in other words, the warm-up question shouldn't be something that would be too difficult for someone who really just read the subject the night before, uh, but also it shouldn't be so easy that they just go down the thoughts, done, and no more thinking has to happen. So uh, look at each other's questions and give some criticism. It's okay. We're, we're, we're all confident professors here. So if you tell somebody, well, that's, that's a little too easy, I think it should be harder, or I think that's not the main point that you want to tell your students, that's okay. So maybe 10 or 15 minutes to discuss each group the other's questions. Beginning. <laughs> Subjects 
that, that the students will do better if they have a solid foundation in physics. Uh, and chemists and engineers and mathematicians also, of course, uh, you all have a shared responsibility for getting tech students to graduate and become the, the next generation of great scientists and engineers. Um, I'd like to continue this discussion, just, just another step, and then we'll, we'll move on to those, those last few troublesome items of implementation. So, now that you've done this, the, this, this issue of generating student responses, uh, actually, first, let me, let me take a quick poll, so just a show of hands. How many of you wrote more than three typical student responses? More than three. How many of you wrote more than five typical student responses? No? Okay. How many of you wrote at least one typical student response? Okay. So, so, so not so many. Not so many. So, so I think what you're seeing then is that it's difficult to imagine what the students will respond. Is that, is that fair to say? That it's, it's, it's difficult for you to put yourself in the place of a student. So I think that's okay, and, and maybe given that, then we can skip this last point of discussing how those things would be used in class and how they would fit with the concept tests, because that really requires that you have more typical student answers. Um, I think once you try this, you'll start to see student answers, and you'll be surprised at the kinds of things your students are answering the kinds of answers that you get. Some of the surprises will be very good. You'll say, oh, wow, the student only read about this last yesterday, and last night they wrote an answer, and it actually is quite good. They, they're really understanding the subject. Other times you'll look at the student's response and say, wow, I never thought that a student would make a decision like this about this subject. So, what I will do is simply leave you with this. And by the way, if any of you downloaded the PowerPoint slides number two from my website last night, I changed it completely about 10 o'clock last night after dinner. Um, I went back to my hotel, my hotel room and, and made a bunch of changes to these slides. So if you downloaded it before 9 or 10 last night, download it again. Um, but the next discussion, and I'd like you to think about continuing to meet together periodically to discuss how you're doing with just-in-time teaching and peer instruction. And this is the kind of discussion to have. Uh, think about how you use the answers in class. Ask yourself if the way you would use the answers to the warm-ups fits together well with the concept tests that you have planned for that day. And uh, also, this, this concept to discuss, again, with people from your area, how to make improvements to the warm-up questions and to the concept tests so that they work together even better uh, for students to really have, have a deep understanding of these central points in each class. So now, I would like to move on. And I think this is the most important last thing to do, uh, is to have an open discussion of what difficulties you expect when you begin to implement just-in-time teaching or peer instruction. So once again, we can send the microphone around. Yeah, keep those things. All right, so can we have the microphone down front here now? Um, can, can we get the microphone? Okay. So, so this way. Yeah. Okay. Tal vez la, la dificultad más obvia eh, para mí sería 
la administración del tiempo en una clase. Porque si bien la instrucción por pares es eh, muy enriquecedora, el aprender a manejar, cuándo para la decisión, cuándo hacer una explicación, eh, puede perfectamente hacer que la clase se vuelva inmanejable si uno no, no tiene suficiente experiencia. Ok, so it's a good question and I think uh, that, that you'll be surprised at how easy it is to let a question, discussion go for a minute or two too long or to cut it off a little early. Uh, it's, not, it's not a terrible thing. Um, the students will be fairly forgiving and the class will not become unmanageable. It, it can be optimized, of course, when I have students discussing a uh, concept as, for instance, I do one of a few things. First of all, I listen for the, the volume level of the room. And very often it, it goes up very quickly, and then it's fairly flat, and then it starts to, to drop off. And when it starts to drop off, it's a good time to cut it off. Uh, and it doesn't take, it's not that difficult to spot that time. The other thing, I think, is to go around and talk to students. So very often you'll see some students are not participating, and it's good to go and, and talk to them, if for no other reason than because those students will then get the idea that if they don't participate and talk to other students, then they'll talk to the professor, which is more frightening. <laughs> so, while you're out there, while you're walking around in the room, you can tell. Are people talking about the actual subject? Are they writing some diagrams from, from the screen? Or have they started to talk about uh, what they plan to do on a Friday night? And then you know to cut it off. Um, Similarly with the warm up, I think you'll find that it's, it's not too difficult to manage the time. The, the one thing I will say though is that um, if, if you let it go too long, you do run the risk of, of finding that, that students will never all 100% understand a new idea. Uh, and if you try for perfection, then you don't wind up finishing what you have planned for that day. So you do kind of have to, to look at the clock and say, well, I have three or four main topics planned, and we've already spent 15 minutes on the first one. Maybe I'd better move on, even though some students are still left behind. Always remember that the goal is to do better than you had been doing before. Um, we say the perfect is the enemy of the good. So what you're trying for here is good. What you're trying for is better than the old way. But don't hold yourself to a standard of perfection because no one can reach that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, creo que parcialmente contestó un poco la duda o el miedo que yo tengo ahora recién con la pregunta de Marta pero a mí digamos el método tanto de Just in Time como el de Instrucción por Pares me, me hace mucha ilusión aplicarlo pero tengo el miedo de que sea un cambio muy grande para los estudiantes y que de alguna manera se niegue a hacerlo eh, a meterse, digamos, como en las dinámicas, digamos, muy diferente a la que ellos han tenido hasta el momento. Eh, no sé si en algún momento ha tenido algún grupo que, en que mayoritariamente la gente no, no se una la idea, que no cumplan con, con, la, con las lecturas, o que, o que la interacción en clase sea poca, que es fundamental, eh, y si tiene algunas diferencias para, 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 para motivarlos y para para lograr que, que digamos que se logre el objetivo con este tipo de, de, de enseñanza. Yes. So, so these are uh, common concerns and, and entirely justified. But again, I think they're they're relatively easy to overcome. Um, I will say that for my students, for the warm-up questions, I would say that 80% of the students do it all the time, 
and 95% of the students do it at least most of the time. But there's very few students, just a few, who really say, I'm not doing it. But those are the same students who are not doing the regular problem sets, they're not coming to class, uh, they're not doing many things. And, and those students, unfortunately, in every class at every university, there's a few like that. And, and you know, you wish you could save them, but they have to. They have to do their job as well. Um, what, what I would say, though, for the most students, or for the majority of the class, is, is again, and I said this a little bit yesterday, that first day of class is very important. If you invest only five or ten minutes in telling students, okay, so we've asked you to buy a clicker, or we've asked you to have these colored cards, and you, you must bring these things to class every day. This is how we're going to use them, and this is why. And then maybe do a practice vote on some side issue, like what's their favorite, uh, their favorite drinks or their favorite activities or what they're what they're good at, uh, what are their hobbies. Then um, they get the idea that this is normal. And if you explain to them that the reason this is normal is because you want them to have the best possible career as a scientist or an engineer. And with your experience as an instructor, you're confident that this will do that. Then I think you can earn their trust very quickly. And once you earn their trust, they will do a lot of things for you. Uh, I think that uh, that's the, the most important advice I can give in some ways. Uh, and then the other thing, again, is, is to keep reinforcing that by making sure that the warm-ups and, and the use of clickers or whatever system you use are very regular. Happens every day or at least you know predictably Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or whatever schedule your class meets, but, but in a regular way so that they know. And don't let them off the hook. Sometimes a student will come to me, this happens all the time. And they come to me and they say, oh, the battery in my clicker is dead, you know, but I, I still want to get my points. Or, you know, my, my computer uh, was down yesterday and I couldn't do the warm-up exercise. What I tell them is, look, there's, there's many students in this class, and everybody will have a problem somewhere. It's, it's like a bad call in, in, uh, in football. Uh, sometimes the referee makes a mistake, well, hopefully they make a mistake for every team. Um, and, you know, it's aggravating at that moment, but it's only a very small number of points, so just keep going, and by the end of the semester, this kind of error will average out for everyone. Um, so, so let them know that it's important, and, you know, you're not reversing the process, but, um, also, that it's a safe process to participate in, that you're not punishing them for doing badly on these things. I would, this is one reason why I keep the number of points very small. So if they miss one, that's no big deal. In fact, with the concept tests, the way I do it, and again, this is a matter of taste, other people will do this different ways, but for me, uh, they get one point for getting the question correct, and they get half point for getting the question incorrect. So even if they're just there to push the button, they still are getting 50% of the credit. So it's, if, if they miss a little, it's not so bad. Other questions? I'm sure there are other concerns about how this will go. What's the concern?
eh, los parciales, los exámenes parciales se hacen en cátedra, nos lo mismos, eh, yo por ejemplo sí trato de implementar este tipo de actividades donde yo siento que ellos pueden responder. Por ejemplo, para eh, exámenes cortos o juicios. Eh, sin embargo, por ejemplo, de repente ese arraigo a esa evaluación tradicional eh, me parece que es lo que a veces nos cuesta un poco separarnos del método tradicional. Por un lado, esta sería una, una inquietud. Y segundo, eh, supongo que habrá alguna combinación de instrucción justo a tiempo y, e instrucción entre pares cuando ellos están en las preguntas de calentamiento en sus casas y tratando de resolverlas y llamando por teléfono a alguno de sus pares me imagino que eso sucede también solamente ok so two two interesting questions um, one thing I will, so so I may need to be reminded what the second one was but I'll try to answer both questions so The first issue is about how to attach the points for just in time teaching or peer instruction or both to the traditional uh, assessments of students. So when I first started doing this, I had a very similar system. It was approximately 30% for the three uh, midterm exams, one hour exams, 20% for the final exam and then 30% for the laboratory exercises and 20% for the problem sets. So maybe 20% for laboratory and 30% for problem sets. Uh, something like that. So in mathematics, you don't have the laboratory to worry about, but everything else is redistributed. What I would say is to make the peer instruction or the just-in-time teaching not too much, maybe 10% of the total course and simply contract the other areas a little bit, but don't leave anything out. So it's truly extra work. And I think that's fair to ask the students for extra work. Um, I, I, I have a survey, our teacher evaluation survey at the end of the semester, always asks students, how many hours per week do you spend studying for this class? And even for a, a, a very difficult five credit hour uh, electricity and magnetism class, students are typically saying, oh, six hours a week, seven hours a week, on average. And the fact that you're thinking, oh, you should be working 10 hours anyway. So if we give them another assignment that takes one hour, it's not, not a problem. So yes, we are asking students for extra work. I believe that that's how we get extra work. We're, we're here in some sense because we feel our students aren't learning enough. We probably have very little chance of finding a way for them to learn more without working more. So, okay, the conclusion must be that we're asking them to do some extra work. Uh, it can't be wildly too much amount of extra work because this, they'll be like their other courses, but it can be a reasonable amount. Um, And if the learning is better, then they become a more successful engineer, then fine. So I would simply say, okay, reduce the points for the midterm exams or for the, for the homework by a little bit, and assign those points to the just-in-time teaching, and there. Now the other question you asked was, was in essence, about students on the street, whether they're calling each other on the phone, Or even, you know, sitting in that computer lab right there, working on the problems together. And I have had that happen. Um, so what I say is the following. These are learning exercises. And actually the goal of them is to increase discussion on the subject. So if they wind up discussing what the answer should be or how best to write this up, to me it's not a big deal. Uh, and I even tell them, you're, you're free to discuss these problems, just as I always told them they're free to discuss the problem sets that um, they do for, home, for the traditional homework. But I do tell them, you must write your own answer. So sometimes if it's a web form, it's so easy. They can just, somebody submits it, then they click the back button, highlight the whole thing, copy, then 
The next person sits down, logs in, pays, and there it is, the same identical text. And once in a while that happens, and what I'll do is I'll send those two students an email that says, look, come on. Uh, you know I allow you to discuss this, but this is not reasonable. Let me remind you what the university's policy is on plagiarism. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it at this time, but you must not do this again. Sometimes I think they really don't know that these are not, they think if they're answering to a computer, perhaps it's only a computer that reads it. Uh, and then once they see evidence that you're, you're, you're the professor, that, that you're looking at this and you're saying, hey, don't do that, then, then they don't try it again. Well, one or two students will always give you a problem. Um, and it's up to you to decide how rigorously to respond to an issue like that. But again, uh, if, if you have students who are doing this on that, on the warm-up assignment, they're probably also doing it on your other home. And the, you know, it's not new, it's just spreading the same problem over different assignments. And, uh, and as long as it's benefiting 90% of the class, if 10% of the class is having a problem, well, that 10% probably already had a problem. And there may be no way to fix those people if they're truly, you know, deeply dishonest here. Okay. Yes. Eh, profesor, antes de hacer un comentario y una pregunta, eh, me gustaría hacer una pregunta para poder formular un poco mis ideas. ¿Cuántos cursos eh, al semestre usted imparte en la universidad? Ah, ok, the typical load for faculty members in my department in physics is to have the lecture of one of the main courses, uh, an upper level physics class or one of the service classes, plus one of the small sections of the service classes. That's a standard level. Dos cursos aproximadamente, adicional de lo que es investigación y otras cosas. Muy bien. Eh, bueno, mi comentario y mi pregunta. Eh, algunas veces no quiero parecer o que mi comentario sea un poco como resistente al cambio, para nada. De hecho, cuando decidí personalmente venir al curso es precisamente para aprender metodologías de enseñanza que favorezcan ¿verdad? el aprendizaje de la materia de la cual imparto. Pero este, hay dos cosas que yo creo que aquí es común, tal vez no lo hemos dicho y no es una queja, es tal vez un desahogo, que es el tiempo, ya lo hemos conversado con respecto a que todas estas actividades son muy valiosas para el aprendizaje, pero requieren tiempo. Cuando hablamos de eh, tanto eh, enseñanza justo a tiempo como instrucción por pares, eh, requerimos en ocasiones dar un puntaje. Y ese puntaje, en otras palabras, por más pequeño que sea, significa una evaluación. Para, para lo cual, de forma responsable, así como construimos el ejercicio, ya sea de calentamiento o de instrucción por pares, tenemos que tener la responsabilidad del tiempo de calificar estos, estos, eh, este trabajo por parte de los estudiantes, por más pequeño o, o grande que sea para ellos. Entonces, este, hay algunas cosas importantes. Primero, tolerancia a la frustración. Debemos, eh, como profesionales, tener mucha tolerancia a la frustración cuando el tiempo es limitado definitivamente y aunque existen muchas ideas interesantes que podemos implementar en ocasiones el tiempo nos cobra eh, eh, este trabajo no poder organizar también de la mejor forma es por un lado por otro lado eh, hay una cosa muy importante y es como una pareja una relación eh, este trabajo es de los del estudiante y del profesor eh, por político, por cultura, no sé cómo llamar en realidad este, muchos de los estudiantes, que es la mayoría, según mi percepción, no toman el trabajo eh, que deben de hacer con responsabilidad.
responsabilidad. Entonces es un desgaste, ¿verdad? A la hora de estar empujando al estudiante a hacer una actividad que por naturaleza en el proceso de aprendizaje ellos deben de eh, realizar. No se puede generalizar sabiendo que hay estudiantes muy responsables y dedicados que dedican ese tiempo. Entonces, independiente de todas las variables, como, eh, como profesionales en un área en particular, poder sacar adelante un grupo con estas técnicas de aprendizaje eh, cuando los grupos son muy situados, ¿verdad? en el sentido de, de interés y formación propia de cada uno de esos estudiantes y a la vez este, poder este, implementar las técnicas se me hace como una, un caos en la cabeza. So, um, these, are, these are very important concerns, and um, I can tell you that there are concerns that I share and my colleagues share, and it's true uh, across every institution where I've ever spoken to faculty, whether the most prestigious or, or the smallest and, and the least prestigious, uh, whether the students are excellent or, or weak, whether the subject is physics or uh, mathematics or English or, or nursing um, or, or, or even some corporate training on small things. So you, you, you have many different issues and frustrations wrapped into that question. And I, I'll do my best as, as a physicist to analyze it, to, to pick them apart and deal with some of the pieces. But of course we're all human. And in the end, it's the putting together of those, those concerns that really makes the chaos. So, first of all, I will say that, yes, the, the students at your university and my university and uh, Harvard University and University of Texas and Davidson College and the U.S. Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy. I've never been to any university anywhere in the world where the faculty said, oh, our students work so hard, uh, it's, it's a wonder that they don't learn everything in the world. It never happens. There's no such university. Every place we want our students to work hard. At Harvard, they think, oh, the students don't work hard enough. At a small community college in a remote part of Idaho, that you're saying, oh, our students don't work hard enough. I wish I had the ones from Harvard. Um, the goal, again, is always to take whatever work your students do and ask them to work 10% harder, 20% harder, 30% harder. You'll never make them work five times harder. If they're putting in five hours a week, it's unreasonable to ask them to put in 30. But you can ask them to put in 70. And in those extra two hours per week, that's a 40% increase. It's not so bad. They can actually, if they could learn 40% more of your subject, that would make me very happy. So, um, so that's the goal. And the way to make them work harder is usually to make them feel like that work is more useful and to make them feel like their goal is attainable. I'll tell you a story that one of my older, wiser colleagues told me once, which I think is, is a good metaphor for the job of a teacher. What he told me is that to be a, a teacher, to be a professor at a university, teaching a class, is, is like a bus driver in a big city like Chicago. Because what the bus driver does, a really skilled bus driver, is to pull away from the bus stop just fast enough that, he, that an old lady will keep chasing the bus because she feels like she's almost going to catch it. I'm not sure if that metaphor translates very well. But, but the idea is that if you race too far ahead of your students, then they say, oh, this is impossible. And they just give up. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you go too slowly, then they catch up to you right away and they feel like, oh, this class is boring. I can spend my time someplace else. So, so your job is, is to have the right pace. And I will say, to be a professor, to get better and better at it is a lifelong thing. I've been a professor at my university for 20 years, and every year I make small changes and also big ones in the way I teach my class. Um, and, and I could give you know several hours of just the tiny little things that I've changed, um, all of which have the underlying goal of helping my students be more motivated to work a little harder. Because if they work a little harder, they're happier with the subject, I'm happier with them, we're both happy. So for instance, it's a long-standing tradition, probably everywhere in the world, when you grade an exam, to take a red pen and mark what's wrong. Right? Do people do that? You mark what's wrong with a red pen? To a student, that, that just means you're focused on their faults, and you're marking this, these danger signs. Red is always the danger color in most cultures. At least, uh, you know, it's the, the red berries that are poisonous and this sort of thing. Stop signs are, are red in, in almost every country. So I stopped doing that. I started using a bright blue pen, and I mark what's correct instead of what's wrong. And, and it's just a subtle reminder that what, what I'm doing when I look at their test is looking for the things that they did well. And sometimes I'll write, oh, excellent, you know, good, good solution, uh, instead of just marking what's wrong. Just this last, and I started doing that maybe 10 years ago, and it, you know, it helps just a tiny amount, but every tiny amount is worth something. It costs me nothing to mark with a blue pen instead of red. Something I'm doing today, which I'd like to draw your attention to. When I come here in the morning, the first thing that I did was I took my wallet and my cell phone and my car keys and my house keys and my sunglasses and all of the stuff that I always carry stuffed in my pockets and put it in my laptop case. So when I'm talking to you and don't have anything to fiddle with, play with my keys, I don't have this big chunk of stuff weighing down my pocket which looks foolish, and it's not because I'm vain and want to look, uh, you know, uh, handsome. That's beyond the possibility. It's, it's just because I know that students find these things distracting. And if I can make them pay 1% more attention by eliminating those distractions in my appearance, then I'll do that. It's not so hard for me to take my keys out of my pocket at the beginning of class and put them back in my pocket when the class is over. So, so it's all of these things. And, and teaching is a lifelong process of change to, to keep your eye on these possibilities. And this is why I encourage you always to talk to your colleagues in your department and in other departments uh, across the university to exchange these ideas uh, for, for what can make your life as a teacher more effective and therefore more pleasant and therefore more effective for the students. Okay? Oh, I should, you know, I always answer a short question with a long answer. So a long question is a very long answer. <laughs> but, but you also mentioned time. And that issue does deserve some additional comments. Yes, when you do this, it does add a little time to your work. Uh, and I think I gave some example numbers yesterday. But what I'd say is, when you first develop warm-up questions for a class, it, it takes some time. Um, you know, it might take, for each lecture that you give, half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour at the most, to really think about what are all the warm-up questions and how they should be worded. And that is with, with my feeling of writing those very carefully and you know, choosing each word carefully. 
of course, if it's a big service class that other people in your department teach periodically, you can do this as a team and share that love. Then when you're in the middle of the semester and the question is how to assign the, the points to those things, it can be done very quickly. And let me give you a couple of tips. So one is, for the peer instruction part, if you're using these cards, there's no marks. It's, it's just for you to see what students are thinking, and, and there's, there's nothing recorded, so there's zero time other than choosing the questions. For the just, if you're doing it with clickers, you may have to move some files around um, to, to use the clicker software to export a CSV file, that's usually the way I do it, and then import that CSV file into your gradebook. Um, whether you use a gradebook in online or in Excel or some other place. Um, so there's a few minutes there, but you know, maybe it's 10 minutes per class. For the warm-up questions, the way I do the marking is the following. And this is very I say, okay, first of all, the points are all or none. So they either get full credit or they get zero. My assumption is that every student who submits anything gets the full credit. So, so it's a question of importing the list of students who submitted anything at all into my grade book and giving them each the full points. Then I go back, and because their answers are all in one big file, I can just scan through it, literally at the rate that I move the mouse. So I'm just scanning visually. Your brain is very good at picking up patterns. So, if you, if as long as you're seeing the words that are important to that subject, if you're teaching physics and you're seeing the words energy a lot, you're seeing momentum, you're seeing force. If you're, if you're teaching chemistry and you're seeing, I don't know what the subject might be, Lewis acids, Lewis bases. You're, you're teaching mathematics and you're seeing constant of integration and you're seeing uh, something about um, integration by parts or whatever it is, you can literally just move the screen and scan for the garbage. And if you see garbage, okay, you take away the points from that student. If you see the just rattled keys, so it's completely random letters, or you see somebody's writing blah, 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 uh, or they're cutting and pasting uh, football scores or something in there, then you see that, you take that away, and in class, you show that, and you say, I'm not sure whether someone was maybe testing me, but I don't want to see this again. And the embarrassment, they'll never, you'll never see that again. So, so then all you have to do is really check for garbage. And your brain can spot the garbage so fast. To me, it's literally about 10 seconds per student do the scan for garbage. So if I have 100 students, it's 1,000 seconds, so that's 15 minutes more or less to do all of the grading for 100 students. And that is, I think, a fair amount for me to invest uh, in an extra grade. And, and by the students seeing that, that you know, there is this other side of my own grade, and once in a while, I make a remark during class. So last night, while I was looking through your warm-up assignments, I noticed the following. And this helped. You know, he's doing all this work. So again, the more work you're doing, the more work they feel they owe you. For my students, there is this process where they can withdraw from the class. Um, I don't know if you have that here. Up to about halfway through the semester, they can say, you know, my schedule is too heavy. I want to drop out of this class, but I'll keep taking my other classes. Can your students do that? So we withdraw? Okay, so, so they can do that. Very often I've had the experience, since I started doing this sort of thing, of my students when they withdraw, they come and tell me, I'm sorry, I have to withdraw from your class. I really wish I didn't have to, but, uh, you know, there's this thing going on in my life, my car broke down, you know, my, my child is ill, my mother is ill, whatever it is. But, but they're apologizing to me 
for leaving the class. And although I'm sorry to see them go, somewhere, you know, I can tell, okay, they really did feel like they owed me something. And if you feel like your students owe, if your students feel like they owe you work, then you're doing it right. And you can get to that point by earning their trust, by explaining to them that the um, work is important for them, that you have their best interests as your goal, and that you're working together as a team. If you do that, they will feel like they owe you, and this is the way to, to a good life as a professor and as a successful student. Other questions? Yes. Back down in front of you. And the 
question is, which sets of arrows best describe the forces that they place on each other? And one of the sets of arrows has the, the big charge putting a bigger force on the small one, and one has a bigger force on the large one, and one has the two forces equal and opposite, and then one of the choices, there's not enough information to tell. So that again is a conceptual question. Do they understand that the forces must have equal magnitude, even though the two objects don't have equal charge? Um, so, so I've changed my exams to that small one. But I think, actually, if you are doing this situation where some people are adopting just in time teaching or through instruction or both, and others are teaching the traditional way, but the students are all taking the same exams, you have an opportunity to really do some research on whether this is effective or not by comparing how the students do in, in one section versus the students in the other. Now, I will give a small caution on doing that because sometimes the students are in one section versus the other um, by choice, so it's not a random sampling. Um, it depends how the students are put in. If, for instance, we have we have the situation in the class that I'm teaching this semester, two of the recitations of physics are clearly better students than the students in the other ones. And it's because of the time of day that those sections meet in comparison to the times of day that the calculus classes are taught. It turns out that the students who meet in the one class are usually one semester behind in calculus, the students who are in the other section. So, so they're not a random sample, so you can't really compare. But if the classes were at the same time in the past as they are in the future, then you can do that comparison. Has the change from last year to next year been different for one section than it is for the other? And I would encourage you to, to look at the data, to do this kind of experiment, because, well, for several reasons. One is because as scientists, you always want to know whether what you're doing is, is effective. But another reason is because if you can generate evidence that it is effective, then you can take that data to your administration and ask for some money to help support the growth of this technique. Um, you know, maybe it's a matter of getting the greater or putting more funds into the development of the digital tech or, you know, whatever it might be that you need to support the growth. Uh, there's nothing like showing the provost some evidence that actually students are doing better or are more happy. Okay? All right. Yes? Y tal vez así como para ir terminando nuestra participación, <risa> eh, mi compañero y yo estábamos discutiendo que queríamos preguntarle una, una así muy concretamente. Cuando hace una lectura, ¿usted deja una guía de estudio o nada más dice lean tal apartado del texto? Porque nos parecía que podía ser muy realizador. Eh, Decirle al estudiante, de todo esto que trae el texto, porque el texto trae comentarios, ejemplos, etc. Quiero que se enfoque en estos conceptos básicos, por lo tanto, pero está presente así, quiero que revise esta lista de conceptos en esta lectura, que podría ser muy interesante para los que tienen tiempo. Debe estudiar y el mío también. Yes. So, uh, in the past, what I would do was always just to assign the reading and say the reading sections one through five of chapter eight. Uh, and that was all the guidance the students had. And what I discovered was that most of them didn't do it. This was actually the genesis of just in time teaching. This was there. The first time that, that we had uh, a website was in 1997, very early, before that. So students were using Mosaic as a platform. And not everybody even had their own computer. We said, okay, you have to go to the computers in the library to do this. 
Um, the students who did have a computer often had a 19.6 thousand baud modem. Um, and, you know, it was a very different world. What we discovered was that putting in the warm up assignments, which at first our only goal was how do we get the students to do the reading? That was the only goal. We weren't using the answers in the class or even had any particular expectations that the answers would be useful. Those things were our own discoveries later. The first semester we did it, it was just to get the students to do the reading. And what we found was that by asking the questions to the students, that is a way of telling them what to focus on when they do the reading. So what you're suggesting, I think, would be very good also. Um, but to just say, OK, answer these four questions, if the names of those concepts are in the questions, students automatically understand that those are the things that you want them to focus on when they do the reading. I will also comment that you've touched on a point, which is a, a, a sore point for me, which is that the textbooks that you have nowadays I think are very bad. They have so much junk in them. It used to be that a textbook told you the story of physics or chemistry or mathematics. Now they have the story and they have examples and then they have the different kind of examples that are in a green box and then they have the pictures with a caption. Sometimes they mean nothing. You're learning about rotational motion. They have a picture of a person jumping on the skis. Well, okay, so they wrote a big thing. Um, and then, then they have study tips, and they have self questions, and they have all of these other things in, in colored boxes and red boxes and with lines around them, one column, two columns. It's so confusing. Uh, I wish you could get a textbook that just tells the story. But I think the publishers found that they make more money by putting this junk in, and there's no way to beat because that's all they care. And the levels, the tenders, all the way. Yes, the levels. Yes. Okay. I think we all, it's five minutes of noon. And I know Monica wants us to take a picture also. Um, but there, there are some more questions in the back there. I'll hang around for a little while. And maybe get some more questions, but let's end the formal session now so we can get the picture.